We've got a bullpen of great stars here at the Nine Network, the team all across the board, but some of them you see on camera, and one of those great folks is Sean Binkley. And Sean is, Sean has a day job here. He's the membership and database coordinator. He also will coach you through Passport in the most beautiful and kind and loving way ever. Um, he's also a tremendous foodie, hence why you're going to hear from him today. And he's also the host of this really cool show that we do online. It's on Facebook called The Nine Outline. And he and his great colleague, Ernmardia, take you through all the great content that you should be um, consuming. I'll do a food thing. Consuming on Nine. And so please welcome Sean Binkley. All right, I am Sean. She said, like she said, I am uh, one of the hosts of The Nine Outline. It's our weekly rundown show where you can check out all the stuff you should be watching this week, all the events that are going on. It's really cool, and we'd love to have you guys as viewers. Uh, but today, I am here to talk to the founder of Christopher Kimball's Milk Street and the host of Milk Street Television, host of a weekly public radio show and podcast, Founded Cook's Magazine in 1980, served as publisher and editor, uh, editorial director through 1989. 1983, he launched, uh, relaunched Cook's Magazine as Cook's Illustrated, went on to found and host America's Test Kitchen and Cook's Country Television. And he's the author of several books, including the latest from Milk Street, uh, Milk Street, The New Rules, Recipes That Will Change the Way You Cook. Everybody, please welcome Christopher Kimball. Well, we are, we're so glad to have you. Like I said, um, New Rules, I've looked through it. I've read it quite a bit. It is a beautiful cookbook. It's really good. I mean, these pictures, this is like just one of many the amazing, amazing pictures. You guys should definitely pick up a copy. I think there's some at your tables. So you've written like 10 cookbooks at this point over that, right? A lot. Like a lot of cookbooks. Uh, if you include cookbooks by my companies, probably yeah. 100 now. Oh, my gosh. So even way more. So what, I guess, what were some of the goals that you had for this particular one, for New Rules? What were some of the things that you really wanted to get across to readers? Uh, not to tell you how to cook a turkey, because <laughs> I've done that 39 times since 1980, and this year I didn't do a recipe in the magazine for turkey. I figured if by now you don't know how to cook a turkey, call Butterball. That's, <laughs> you, you, you don't need my help. Uh, well, this, you know, I grew up, uh, as many of you did, uh, with sort of bad English cooking and, and pretty good French cooking, uh, you know, through Julia, et cetera, mm -hmm. and, and some classic American cooking. And it, it occurred to me after traveling around the world a lot that uh, it wasn't just a function of there are other kinds of recipes out there or a term I don't like, ethnic recipes. Uh, it, it was just a different way of thinking about cooking entirely. It, it wasn't just different recipes. So everybody in the world has the same problem we have, which is putting dinner on the table. They just have different kinds of ingredients. They have different kinds of cookware sometimes. They have different kinds of kitchens. Uh, and they all solve that problem in a different way. The thing that's interesting is many of those ways are better than the ways I learned growing mm -hmm. up uh, because uh, they have bigger flavors. Um, the cooking is not fussy. Um, you know, if you think about French cooking, this is a really long answer to very quick, short, <laughs> short We got question. a while. Take your time. We got a while. Um, if you think about it, French cooking, is about taking fairly bland ingredients, right? High quality bland ingredients, and using technique, time, and heat to, to transfer, uh, to create flavor. Mm -hmm. Beef bourguignon, right? So, uh, which is an incredible pain. Uh, and, you, and you never have to make it again. I'm now relieving you of the burden <laughs> of making that dish. And also, you never have to perfectly dice an onion, because that's only for Jacques Pepin. You don't have to do it that way. So uh, if you look around the world, though, they might start with ginger or shoyu or pomegranate molasses or garlic or lemongrass or spices, cardamom, or they might start with coriander or cumin. So they're starting with big flavors, and so they're not depending on the cooking to develop flavor. You know, stir-fried rice in Thailand, in Chiang Mai, takes six minutes, and it starts with big flavor, and then three minutes later, you still have big flavor. So you don't have to develop flavor as much. Hmm. And so it's more complex. There's more, you know, there's charred, there's sour, there's bitter. Bitter is something we don't use very much in America. Uh, there's lots of different kinds of flavors, and there's lots of combinations. Uh, most of the world puts sweet and savory, right? We, our sweet is at the end. I don't mind that because I like dessert. But, I mean, sweet and savory does go together. So to answer the question, there are new rules uh, in other places in the world because they cook differently. And I wanted to put them in a book and bring them to people so you could go, oh, okay, you know, I don't have to saute beef for stew anymore. 
By the way, you don't have to do that. Uh, so, and you, and you think about, well, why did I do it that way all these years? And then it, then it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I literally have on this card, why don't you sear your beef? <laughs> Rule number 72 in your book is, yeah, don't steer your meat before you, sear well, your meat before you make a stew. First of all, most, most, um, most places in the world use meat as a flavoring, right? So you might have a pound of meat in a, in a soup or stew. Uh, in a classic American stew, you'd have five pounds of shoulder or something, mm -hmm. right? Well, that's a lot of umami. I mean, that, that's major, you know, heavy-duty, turbocharged umami. So when you saute meat, you develop more umami. Do you need more? No, you don't. Uh, you have plenty. The other thing is you can let the oven do the work for you. So uh, don't use too much liquid. And by the way, using a lot of wine uh, in meat, it sucks the flavor out of the meat. Uh, so use uh, just a, some tomato, something very simple. Cook it in the oven for two hours with the cover on, take the cover off, and the oven will brown the meat while you're having a martini or whatever you like to do or, or watching public television uh, or, or watching my show. Uh, and then about an hour and a half later, you come back and the top of the meat is beautifully browned and you didn't have to do it yourself. No splattering, you know, this, you know, saute the meat in batches. There are two things in the recipes I, it just drives me crazy. Saute the meat in batches, I'm not, I'm not ever gonna do that again. And two, add just enough water till the pie dough holds together, <laughs> which we can talk about, which is also a mistake. So uh, you let the oven do the work. But you know, meat really should be not the main event. Meat should be part of the whole. Uh, and so in the Middle East, for example, which is mostly vegetarian, they use some meat. You know, meat is part of it, but it's not just meat. Uh, and so thinking about how to use meat, uh, just it, it transforms your, your way of thinking about food. Sure. I love that. I'm so used to searing to get that Maillard reaction. So it's still like my brain is like, not. <laughs> you know, like we all have so to, this is a psychoanalyst thing. Yeah. I mean, you have to let go of my art. I'm sorry. You're just all <laughs> going to have to let go. Uh, put more salt in your food and let go of my art, and you'll feel fine in the morning. Yeah. Be good. Healthy on attachment. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, my art's good. If you're going to cook something very quickly in a, in a skillet in 10 minutes, mm -hmm. sure. That, that's great. And, and then you do that. It, the other thing I would say, you should also, this is the, the triad of things you don't have to do. Why do you stock? Well, stock was done for a reason. At the back of the stove, you had a big coal stove, the back burner, there are two back burners, were, were fairly cool, and you had a big pot of water, and every time you prepped, you put in the, the mushroom stems and this and that, you, you just throw all the, the chicken bones, and it was a frugal way of turning, creating something great out of scraps. G fabulous idea. Unfortunately, very few people are, are standing at a coal stove all day. Uh, and so stock, for example, when I cook a chicken, I use a Chinese method, white cooked chicken, you put the chicken in simmering water for about 25 minutes. You turn the water off, let it sit there another 40 minutes, and it's perfectly cooked. And guess what? You get chicken stock in a cooked chicken. And, and the chicken's perfectly moist. So when you cook meat and water, you get stock. So why do you need stock? Well, the only time you need stock is, again, a, a quick something in a skillet. You might start with stock. But most of the time, you make your own, and you, you get much better stock with meat than you do with bones. Mm. I mean, bones is that's because it was frugal, they didn't want to throw them out. But if you start with a whole chicken and cook it in water, you're gonna have fabulous stock and just reduce it down and you have this terrific stock. So, you know, stock, and besides which, most of the stock you buy in the supermarket is better living through chemicals. I mean, it's, you know, yeah. someone once said they waved the chicken over the top of the can. You know, there's not, a, they're not making this just out of chicken and water. They're, 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 let's look at the list of ingredients. So your water, most people cook with water in the world because it's cheap. I, it also allows the flavors of the other ingredients to, to come through, right? I mean, you get to taste the other ingredients, and, and I think bad supermarket stock is going to, you know, cover up those yeah. flavors of the fresh vegetables. Muddy it up. Make Muddy it, it up. So it's not a, most of the time, it's probably not worth using. Sure. Well, it sounds like a, a great time saver, too, to not, you know, have that stock going, wasting your time. You can just stick to right, right with water. You and you'll sear. sleep better, too. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's another burden. <laughs> that, you, that you're just letting it, what is it, let it go? Just let it go. Let it go. Yeah. Um, so I guess my next question for you is, um, what, I mean, like I said, you have 75 rules in there. It's a lot of really, really great information, but what's the one, what would be the one, if you had to boil it down to one, what's the one cardinal rule you want all these guys to know when they leave today? Cooking or about life? Yeah. <laughs> Open to interpretation. <laughs> I, I have nothing, I have six kids, so I have nothing useful to, to say about life at this point. Um, 
that, that I can actually suggest. Um, well, I think um, the, the best thing to remember is flavor. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the rules was end a dish like a soup or a stew with some of the ingredients and flavors you started with. So if you had ginger or garlic or a spice uh, or vinegar or an herb, at the end, you might add a little bit extra to punch it up. It's that last five minutes, three minutes before you serve something that's critical. So adding a little vinegar to something, add a little lemon juice to something, add a little something sweet at the end. Uh, pomegranate molasses is one of my favorite secret ingredients. It's just pomegranate juice cooked down like cane syrup. Uh, and it's, 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 it's sweet, but it's sour. Um, or a little bit of spice at the end. Uh, you know, in many cultures, they don't use a tablespoon of herbs. In Mastery that a French cooking, you'd have a teaspoon of chervil, right, or something. Or my favorite, which is just absurd, is a sprig of thyme. I mean, really? I mean, you have six pounds of meat, and you got yeah. a pound well, of potatoes. Wrap it up and with some butcher's twine. Throw and you're going to put Garnier, yeah. a, a sprig of thyme? No. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Yotel Madolenghi, years ago, when I ran into him, he, you know, he taught me, you know, use your hand. You know, so have a, have a hand handful of basil or have a handful of parsley or cilantro and, and just put that in at the very end. There's a con, which is a Vietnamese soup, which is uh, a broth with little pork meatballs and just tons of cilantro. And so you can use handfuls. So the, the one rule is you, you almost can't get too much of big flavors and use big flavors because it makes, it t takes the cooking part is less important and it's just the flavors you're putting in that it's more important, and that's how you get great food. Love that. So you talked about like uh, pomegranate molasses. What are some of those really exciting, kind of new, readily available ingredients that you can get on Amazon or whatever that you think we should have in our pantries? You should all spend 100 bucks uh, and just get a few things. Uh, I grew up in a household where we bought our four spices in the first Eisenhower administration. And when Reagan, Reagan's inaugural, uh, they were still there, <laughs> mostly unused. And we had Lowry's, I was talking earlier, Lowry's seasoned salt, uh, which, yeah. Uh, so, um, there, first of all, you should have whole spices as well as ground. Um, and here's an interesting fact about spices. I just ran into somebody recently who's going to help us source spices around the world. Guess how old the spices are when you buy them in the supermarket or anywhere. I mean, by the time you buy them. Two years. Guess how many hands uh, spices go through from the farmer just to get to the states? Twelve. Because they're shippers and they're truckers and they're people doing this and added value, et cetera. So, uh, and also they don't sell spices if the, if the market price is low. They, they put it in storage. And when the price goes up, they sell it. So you're buying two-year-old spices. So when someone says, how long should I store my spices? Well, it's already been stored two years, <laughs> so who cares? You know, it's already two years old. Uh, so uh, whole spices like coriander and cumin are great. Uh, smoked paprika, pimenton, is mm -hmm. fabulous. Uh, peppers, you know, other than black pepper, there's Aleppo pepper, which is not grown in Syria anymore, but for obvious reasons, but it's very fruity, it's nice. Uh, there's something called urfa pepper, U-R-F-A, which is... Uh, very dark and chocolatey and sort of wet and damp and has a wonderful flavor to it. Um, those are just a few. And, and uh, turmeric, of course. But just get a decent uh, sumac is uh, the, the little red berries. Uh, and they're sweet and sour. They're sort of used in place of lemon at one time. Uh, th that's wonderful. A few mixes sitar. Sitar is a wild thyme leaf from the Middle East. Uh, and it's with poppy seeds and sumac. Uh, it's, it's a blend. Delicious, and you can get yeah. that anywhere. And you can... Uh, a friend of mine uh, has a Turkish restaurant in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I interviewed her once, and, and the result of the interview was, the t-shirt was, it's the Zatar stupid. You know, just, she puts Zatar <laughs> in everything. That, that, that was her whole concept for the restaurant. Put it's Zatar. a great garnish. Yeah. yeah. I, I think she put it on her ice cream, too. I mean, it was on everything. <laughs> <coughs> um, uh, another thing I learned, I was in Galilee recently uh, and cooking with Reem Cassis, who wrote The Palestinian Table. Every family has their own spice mix, which they make. So they take whole spices, they toast them in a skillet for two or three minutes, uh, cool them down, then grind them up. They keep for three or four months in a closed container. And that, that family's recipe, they use on almost everything. So coming up with your own spice mix, you can go online and, and look at them, but have, have your own spice mix and just that's your go-to mix. And that will be great. Because if you're cooking salmon or cooking chicken or cooking beef, whatever, you can use that and it's just a head start. 
and it's a great way to quickly have something on hand. And the holidays are coming up. That makes a great gift. Somebody gave me like a jar of like their own special spice blend. Amazing. Yeah, and then you don't give you the recipe, so you have to come yeah, exactly. back and you get more. Keep coming. Yeah. Well, and then the first one, they don't charge you. Yeah, and then that, that's yeah. right. Well, the, the other, other thing is a lot of places in the world have seasoned salt other than Larry's. Um, but in Georgia, they have sort of a garlic salt. We, actually, we're coming out with six blends shortly. But um, having a seasoned salt is great because mm. it's all done for you. You mm. know, it's just one of those things you have on hand. All right, so we got ingredients uh, taken care of. What, in terms of gadgets, gizmos, you know, skillets, cooking utensils, what do you think everybody should have in their pantry? Um, well, I have uh, a full, the 70s, I bought a full copper French battery de cuisine, which hangs from my ceiling and it gets duller every year because I don't use it. Um, I, I, I've really gotten it down to a few things. A, a six to eight quart uh, Dutch oven, a uh, Staub, I love their stuff, or Le Creuset, I love, but I prefer Staub. Um, a uh, carbon steel skillet. I can't talk enough about it. These are very inexpensive. They can cost 20 bucks, 30 bucks. I get a 10 inch, uh, and if you season it properly, it, it's, it's easier to use than cast iron. It is nonstick. And I cook scrambled eggs in it three times a week, and I, you can cook fried eggs in it. And as long as you keep it seasoned, which is not hard, uh, I don't like. Um, Nonstick skillets. My, my question is, when the coating goes off, you know, where do they go? Does it go, yeah, inside. In, in, in my stomach. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So, uh, and and they, if you buy nonstick, you know, buy a cheap one and throw it out and buy a new one every year. That's the easiest way to do it. But a carbon steel skillet's great. A cast iron skillet's great. Uh, and then just a 12-inch regular, you know, stainless steel skillet with an aluminum, you know, ply inside is fine. Um, one other thing I use is a rice cooker, but it's not electric. Um, there is the old-fashioned Japanese method is a terracotta pot with an inner cover and outer cover, and it makes the world's best rice. Uh, you, it starts steaming, you cook it for two minutes, turn the heat off, it's done in 15 minutes. It's fabulous. Um, you know, that's kind of a specialty item, but it's really terrific. And then I think a good uh, a digital read thermometer with a big readout is great. Thermopen's terrific. Don't get the little analog dials because the difference between 160 and 180, you can't possibly read because yeah. it's too small, and so that's they're useless. Um, and the other thing is knives. You know, uh, Western knives, uh, for some reason, the last 100 years, have become heavier and heavier. There's a, a rush to weight. And that's why most people don't know how to use a knife because a 10 or 12-ounce knife is just too heavy. It's like driving a sports car and you're just trying to get to work. Uh, and so, But Japanese knives traditionally have very thin blades, uh, they're very light. They're about six ounces, and they're terrific because the thinner the blade, the less work it is to, to slice through food. So especially with vegetables, um, you can get a nakiri, which is looks like a Chinese cleaver, but it's only two inches high, uh, a santuko, whatever. But a, a, a good Japanese vegetable knife is really essential, uh, or, or a light chef's knife. But those big, heavy chef's knives, you can use them occasionally, but they're hard to use, and uh, you're likely to cut yourself. So a, a light Japanese knife is terrific. Nice safety. Love it. Uh, just before Christmas, so. Yeah. yeah, put it on your list. Santa's listening. Um, so, I mean, I've said it a million times. New Rules, fantastic cookbook. You guys are going to love it. Um, there are some really great recipes in it. What would you say is the favorite recipe that you developed for it? Or three, like up to three. This is like <laughs> asking me, which of my kids do I love the most? Steven. An answer I am... Well, we, we, there is no answer to that question. Um, it depends on the mood I'm in. Okay. Um, I, I would say w one of the most useful things in the book, though, is how you cook pasta. Uh, you know, as you know, in Italy, for most recipes, you undercook your pasta, you take it out, you reserve some of the pasta water, uh, you put it in a skillet with a sauce, like I was in Bologna recently, and they take the ragu bolognese, which, by the way, has no dairy in it, so I don't know where that came from, but... They don't use dairy. Yeah. Uh, and they, they put the pasta in a skillet, and they put the ragu in, and then they saute it for a couple of minutes and heat it up, and the sauce gets sucked up into the pasta, and they put some of the cooking water in it as well, which gets absorbed into the pasta. It helps it stick to the pasta with yeah. the starch, yeah. Uh, with the starch. So that's the best way of cooking. You, what you don't want to do is the, um, you know, the, the, the wet spaghetti with a huge blob of tomato sauce on top, and never the two, they're just totally divorced. They're, you know? Yeah, they're not married. It's sad. They're not married. Well, <laughs> speaking of that, salt and pepper should get a divorce. Because really? in the Middle East, it's salt and cumin. I mean, yeah. salt and pepper have nothing in common. 
salt, salt doesn't work like, it's not a spice, it's yeah. salt. And, and pepper is a spice. Well, there are lots of spices, so why salt and pepper? It's just because that's what we had, I guess, in yeah. Europe and the trade from the East. But the fact of the matter is other cultures don't ever think of salt and pepper in the same sentence. But, you know, pepper is used when appropriate. No. But it's not, oh, let's put, you know, would you like some pepper with that, sir, with a huge you know, the grinder? <laughs> on your bowl of cereal. Uh, on your yeah. bowl of you know, Cheerios, you know. So, <coughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, so this one might be a little bit easier to answer then. Were there any notable recipes that did not make the cut? Sure, but I'm not going to tell you which ones. <gasps> oh, uh, no. <laughs> what, no. I, well, I mean, the, the, the problem is that, uh, you know, if you think about what Julia did, uh, she translated. She was a translator. That was her great skill. Mm -hmm. So Simone Beck had the recipes, right? And she took those recipes and then adapted them to the American home kitchen. So she cooked with a, you know, a really horrible American supermarket chicken versus the one that was running around Provence. Uh, and it was a translation. And I think that's the same thing we try to do is, you know, we're not, we're not trying to reproduce something authentically because you can't. You know, if you, if you make a dish in Oaxaca, well, you don't have the same kind of pork lard, and you don't have the same, the corn tortillas are totally different. So it's not a question of authenticity, it's a, it's a, it's a question of translating. So the, re, the, the dishes that would not make it into a book or magazine would be dishes that just don't translate well. Sure. So uh, my editor is in Vietnam actually this week, uh, I just talked to him this morning, and so he's, you know, he has a list of recipes he wants, he goes around, he cooks with people in their homes, but some of those are gonna make the translation here well, some are not. And our job is to figure out which of them do translate well. So the ones that make it into a book, they actually, you can make at home and they make sense. If, if a recipe depends on gal and gal as a key ingredient, you can't yeah. substitute anything else, or lemongrass, that's probably not gonna work, or the technique is, is something that we're not used to. Um, you know, if, if you have to cut your own rice noodles by hand, that's probably, he, he was just at a farm recently outside of Saigon where they do, they take this, the rice goo as he put it, they put it on these huge, like, 10-foot mats, and they have thousands of these mats, and they dry them in fields in the sun, and they bring them in and cut them mm -hmm. and sell them. So that's, you know, that's a different kind of rice noodle than what you're going to get here. Sure, yeah. So. Okay. So uh, let's kind of pivot to Milk Street for a quick second. What is it like cooking in front of a live studio audience? How exciting is that? Uh, I don't anymore, actually. Oh. We did that the first year. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then we said, you know, this, this, uh, uh, well, it turns out that having the studio audience, um, we, when we do, we've done some stage th events, that's great. Because yeah. you get 800 people sure. or whatever in, in an auditorium, uh, and then you're reacting with the uh, people, you know, making fun of them and stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> be having a good time. But when you're just cooking, it's really boring watching a, a cooking show being filmed. Uh, hopefully we don't stop and start too much, but there's lots, there's 40 people there, the cameramen, their assistants, there's people in the back kitchen. And so I think for the audience, it's less, uh, it's not like watching the Super Bowl. It's, it's a little more tedious. Sure. So we did that the first year, and then we decided, you know, it'd just be a lot easier for us just to, to do it uh, by ourselves. But if you're doing an event like this, or, you know, a stage event, then it's absolutely fabulous. You know, there was, <laughs> We, we, I did a bunch of these a couple of years ago, and um, I got to the point where backstage, before it starts, you can hear the audience, of course. And if there's a lot of talking and noise and stuff, you know, it's going to be a good evening. But there, there was a place, in, it was a town in California, I can't remember, they were backstage, it was absolutely silent. I mean, you could hear a pin drop. And I said to the person, I said, we're gonna have to work really hard tonight <laughs> to get yeah. this audience going. And it took about an hour we did. But it, that's fun because an, a live audience is really fun. Because when they're having a good time, I used to, we used to do a taste test <clears throat> to determine whether you genetically had a certain kind of uh, structure, DNA, to tell Was when it something's bitter. the one? Yeah. Yeah, it's the bitter. So you take two little tabs of paper uh, and one of them has the chemical on it, one doesn't. And every night I did this, 30% of the audience could not tell that it was bitter. Uh, they, they just couldn't sense it at all. But what I used to do is when they put the first tab in the mouth, I said, well, you've just now taken a tab of acid. And, uh, you'll be, uh, you'll be oh floating in the air in about 20 minutes. Uh, that's my sense of humor. <laughs> That'd be a fun cooking show. I have whatever that gene is. Those papers taste, they're like the worst. They're yeah. so nasty. They're really gross. I don't think that Would you ever use one of those in a cook in a recipe? <laughs> 
Well, bit, bitter, I mean, like yeah. bitter melon, for example, is an ingredient yeah. in many cuisines. Uh, bitter, bitter is an interesting flavor because yeah. it's uh, in chard. Those are things we don't usually do, but they're wonderful if used mm -hmm. properly. I'm not sure a little uh, piece oh, of paper. Oh, no, I'm no, kidding. Be but good. no, I mean, bitter is, it's part of that big spectrum of flavor. You've got to have nice balance, nice, like, layers of nuance. Gotta love it. Um, have there any, been, ever been any uh, kitchen disasters that have been, like, really bad <laughs> whether oh, I mean, no. like a recipe gone really wrong or no i don't you know, know what you're talking about <coughs> you mean things that catch on fire yeah. or people well uh, <laughs> uh, on another show i was on uh yeah there was every year there was the bleeder you know there was always one knife problem so we had a big first aid kit standing by <laughs> and it was usually one person on the cast who tended to do it so uh, anyway it was it never serious actually the worst time was uh f for fun uh, uh, I think it was Becky Hayes was on with me, and she pretended to cut her finger off while doing chicken. And uh, it was actually Kenji lopez Alt, you know, of course, from the Food Lab of great fame. He's writing for the New York Times now. He uh, figured out how to create a fake blood bag. So she cut down and started spurting blood. <laughs> and so I, I was like... Well, somebody call an ambulance. And then, <laughs> Why are you guys just standing around? Wait, yeah. wait, and everyone would just look at me, try not to laugh. <laughs> and finally, after about three seconds, I said, oh, okay. So wait, everybody was in on the joke but you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was hilarious, let me tell you. <laughs> Five years of psychiatric counseling, oh and I've gosh. finally come out of it, yeah. Well, anyway, it was, um, yeah, that was one of the, the more fun moments. The other one was, uh, <laughs> this one actually was funny. Uh, I did, was doing a taste test. It was early in the morning. Uh, it was cheese or something. Or other. It was butter. It was a butter taste test. <coughs> we had thick smears of butter on little pieces of bread. Uh, and I always have a large glass of water to clear my palate. So this this being butter, you know, I needed a lot of water. So I, I took it and, uh, and downed a considerable portion of it. Uh, and then somewhere in the back of my mind, uh, this little voice said, Chris, that's not water. That's gin. <gasps> Uh, that was a fun taste test again. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I had to do 10 more in the day, and I was <laughs> drunk already. So that was, yeah. So, the, you know, those were some of the disasters. <laughs> that sounded really fun. <laughs> yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we got Thanksgiving coming up next week. I mean, it's a huge food holiday. Um, what are some of the... Heard, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you may have heard. <laughs> uh, what are some of the dishes that are going to be on your table this year? Um, well, I, um, I don't, Brian... I, I, I'm sorry, I don't brine my turkey anymore. Um, I've, uh, a friend of mine, John Willoughby, used to be the executive editor of Gourmet, and he also worked for me for years. And he used to say, and I love this, he said, dry turkey breast is why God invented gravy. <laughs> and, you know, I, I sort of, you know, I thought about God that. God did it, invent gravy. It, it, first, I thought, first I thought, he's just being glib. But then I realized he was right, that there is something about dry turkey meat and gravy that is part of my family's tradition. Huh. So, but in any case, I, I now braise it. I take a big roasting pan. I take uh, water, not stock, uh, leeks, carrots, uh, onions, etc. Put them in. Put the dark meat. I I, I, I spashcock the turkey. Put the dark meat down the legs, whole legs. I put the breast on top. Cover it. Cook it for an hour and a half, two hours. Then take the foil off. Then the breast meat, when it's done, comes out. So I solve the white dark meat problem. And then the dark meats makes the fabulous stock. Uh, and then I, I strain it, reduce it down, and that's my gravy. Uh, and it makes the world's most fabulous gravy. And it's really easy, and you don't have to worry about flipping, excuse the expression, flipping the bird. But, you know, the white <laughs> meat, you know, is, is it breast up, breast down, brine it, and forget it. Well, and spatchcocking is such a time saver, too. Well, spatchcocking is, I mean, a big turkey's yeah. no mean feat. Uh, it's but grizzly, I bet. Four pound, well, you got to have really heavy duty. Uh, shears, yeah. Yeah. Like, you know. And the emotional capacity to, like, rip a backbone out of a turkey. <laughs> I have that. I, I have plenty of emotional capacity for that. It's dead already. Uh, I, I get it from Someday Farm in Vermont, Dorset, Vermont. They, they raise their own, so it's nice. Uh, but spatchcocking a chicken's the best way to cook a chicken because you just cook it uh, and you don't have to worry about the white and dark meat cooking at different rates. It's fabulous. And it crisps beautifully. It crisps great, and it's also great for grilling. It's just uh, all you have to do is take. You have to buy the right pair of poultry shears. A lot of them don't work very well. Just snip either side of the backbone, take it out, turn it over, flatten it down, and it's 
put some put some zatar. You know, if you want the foolproof recipe, put some zatar on it. <laughs> and and also another thing I've learned is don't grill over high heat. Um, unless you like, if you cook a steak, I cook in a 250 oven, bring it up to 90 degrees internal, then finish it. Then you can. But if you're going to cook a chicken, keep it on medium low, and you will actually get a wonderful skin. But you're not going to burn it. Uh, you can go have your cocktail or whatever and not worry about peeking in every two minutes. Yeah. Uh, and it's, most grilling should be done over medium low, not high, because you'll get to where you want and you won't overcook the outside of the food. Yeah, that's a good tip because I'm used to the grill, you know, get a good sear over the heat and then move it over to indirect. So you, knowing you, that it's you like... You can do that as well. Yeah, but, well. But most of the cooking should not be over very high heat. Yeah. yeah. What are some seasonal ingredients that you're exciting, uh, excited to work with uh, this fall and winter? Turkey. <laughs> Just turkey. That's, season, <laughs> that's a very seasonal ingredient. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we love, uh, I love sweet potatoes. I love all root vegetables. Uh, I do, uh, we cook a lot of, my wife's mother's from Salzburg, Austria, uh, where they cook Tafelspitz, which is essentially boiled beef. Nice name for it, though. Um, they just simmer, you know, a nice chuck roast in water, take it out, and then throw vegetables in and cook the vegetables. So I, I like that very clean. The meat's very clean. It's very simple. It's an easy recipe. It's great for a crowd. So those kinds of dishes I like I like a lot. And I do a lot of stews and soups as well. So Yeah, it's like soup and stew season. It's squash well, season, too. Well, you know, the, I've gotten to the point, as I, I think I said earlier, but um, if, if I have people over... By the way, no one ever invites me over. I'm just saying, guys, <laughs> so in case. Uh, but uh, when I invite other people over who don't reciprocate, um, you know, I'll cook three things. My rule is three. So I'll cook a soup or a stew. I'll do some other salad, something else, and I'll make a simple dessert. Three things, that's it. Because, I've, you know, years ago when I was starting this business, a British couple invited me over in Connecticut for a brunch, something I don't love. Um, it just seems like... It's, it's like, I don't know, it's like getting up and walking around in your pajamas all day or something. I don't know. See, I'm a millennial. I can't relate to that. We are a brunch people. <laughs> we got to wake up late on a Sunday, roll out with our friends and, you know. Tell May those. God forgive you. <laughs> uh, dispensation. Uh, I don't know about that. But anyway, they, they cook like 20 things, you know. Yeah. But, and, and, and just to be nice, but it's like, you know, how many things. I'd rather have one really good thing than like eight pretty good things. Well, it's so 20 things at a brunch, you things. have to go about your day. You're like filled with food at that point. Millennials don't go about their day on Sunday. Okay, well. What do you, what do you, what do you <laughs> don't you text after brunch or something? We have very important Twitter tweets Yeah, I, I yeah. figured, yeah. We've got Instagram you're busy. posts to do. Your okay? thumbs, they need to work we're, we're busy captioning and hashtagging. <laughs> right. yeah. It's all Instagram after brunch. <laughs> Excellent, so um, I guess, so, have you have you been to St. Louis? Have you and like really I've experienced the food scene? I mean, you know, have you really experienced the food scene? Have you been out? Have you? This is the question. The, the, the problem with these tours is you, you inevitably. Never get out. Yeah. Well, you, you usually have an event at seven, uh, which I do tonight, and then you know it's at a restaurant though, uh, which is good. But usually, you know, you don't get back to ten, and then you know, like I remember uh, touring before, a couple of years ago doing the stage thing, and you get th those lasted longer. You get back to your hotel eleven, and the only thing. This was in Texas. I went to three Texas cities. Every bar had uh, sugared pecans. So I ate an, uh, an old-fashioned with a whole bowl of sugared pecans for dinner <laughs> for an entire week oh my because gosh. everything was closed. So that's, that's the – lunch is about the only time you can really get away because dinner is yeah. actually so, – so what would you recommend? We have uh, – my personal recommendation for any new person to St. Louis lately has been the restaurant Balkan Treat Box I, in I, Webster I Groves. That, it's yeah. amazing. It's Bosnian it food, which, like, you're not going to get anywhere else in America. We have the largest population of uh, Bosnian immigrants outside of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, it's fabulous food. It, it made, like, Bon Appetit's, like, best 50 okay. new restaurants. Um, Wood-fired best fish sandwich I've ever had. You guys should all go there, like, as soon as – actually, it's lunch only, but – yeah, definitely put it on your list. Turns out you actually work there. Huh? That's what, that's what. <laughs> Joke's on you. I'm getting a commission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, but, I, mean, that, I have heard of it. Actually, yeah, yeah, that's my big recommendation. Okay. Like, that's a, that's, a, that's a food scene that you're not going to be able to find anywhere else. Um, it's not like, you know, tacos you can find anywhere. That's something that's, I think, specific and special to St. Louis. And okay. I'm glad I could have shared that with you. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, I think I have one last question before we open this up to you guys. Do you guys have some questions you want to ask? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so this last one, it, it might be a little bit hard for you. Um, you have such an iconic look when you cook. If you had to choose only one item to wear in the kitchen, would it be the bow tie or the apron? Uh, it would be a full body suit, I think. Um, you're not catching me on that one. Uh, uh. That, I, I, I can see that one making it into the, you know, the, the New York Times tomorrow. Kimball only cooks wearing a bow tie. Um, well, the bow tie is Watch quite, uh, is quite uh, reasonable because, it, well, first of all, you might ask, why would anybody, anybody wear any neckwear at all in my job? Uh, but in a kitchen, a bow tie makes more sense than a tie for obvious reasons. Yeah, so I've been wearing it since 1980. Um, uh, and Jim Beard also, by the way, wore a bow tie totally randomly. Um, Probably I should stop wearing ties, but you know, I, I just you know, I, I sort of feel like you should stick with, you know, what, what what's the old expression? Dance with them what brung you? That the old Texas. Expression. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so that's the one that so, brought this you, brung yeah. me. So I, yeah, I, I will continue. It's consistent. Bow ties. There's nothing wrong with having a nice work uniform. I, I have a two and a half year old who wears bow ties occasionally. Yeah. As long yeah. as you don't have a kitchen disaster. Well, he well he 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 goes into my closet and I have all these bow ties and he takes some handfuls off and then he tries to tie it. That doesn't work out too well. And then, uh, so he wears five or six of them around. So he, he can wear a half a dozen at a time. Yeah. That's, that, now that's a look. <laughs> well, and, he's, he's, and then he can go to brunch. Yeah, go to brunch, yeah. all 12 bow ties. All set. He's you know, good. the ninth, yeah. And then he, well, this has been an excellent conversation. Let's open the floor to you guys. If you, I guess, have a question, raise your hand. I don't know. We're adults. <laughs> Okay, so Chris, you are fairly slender, and I wonder how you reconcile all this wonderful food and eating and cooking, and yet keep your weight? Well, 30 years ago, the question was, was you're slender. Now I'm fairly slender. So, <laughs> so he's I, not, see, is the answer to that question. See, I've yeah. actually gained weight, obviously, <laughs> since then. Um, well, you know, when I was, I, I unfortunately answered that question years ago, by talking about how much I exercised and did this and did that, and everyone just got really mad at me uh, because it, it probably wasn't true. Uh, it's purely genetic. I mean, that's all. I mean, I've always been thin. So I, 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 I eat like a horse, actually. So, I mean, the, the problem is you do, being around the kitchen all day, and I do taste a lot of things, you have to get down to one bite because if you, I eat, in the early days, if there was a piece of chocolate cream pie, I would just go through the whole pie. And then someone would say, well, now we're doing lemon meringue at 11. You know? <laughs> uh, so you, you have to control yourself a little. Uh, and I don't eat much dinner. I mean, everybody who works uh, in the kitchen at Milk Street, they basically don't eat dinner because you're eating all day. Yeah. So you, you do your eating. I, don't, I have very light breakfast. Uh, and then it's during, eat during the day. And then dinner is you know, very simple. Um, sometimes I just steal stuff from my two-year-old. Uh, for dinner. So I, I think that's not eating at night or eating a very light dinner is helpful, but it's, it's all genetic. I, I take no credit. <laughs> it doesn't mean I don't love food. Go. Yeah. All right, who else has a question? Um, yeah, actually, I had two questions for oh. you. The first one was you were talking about making your own stock being superior, which of course it would be. But how long would something like that keep in the freezer? Uh, forever. Oh really? Okay. No, no. I would, I would reduce it down, uh, and I, I wouldn't salt it when you okay. first cook it. Reduce it down. Uh, I would never salt stock because you can salt it later, uh, and put it in you know plastic containers, and you can. It's, it's fine. Nothing's gonna. It's not like, you know, freezing blueberries or something or bread. You know, or it's, yeah. or, or even meat. It's it's gonna stay because it's all liquid. You'll use it before it goes bad. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now my other question was you actually mentioned sumac. Um, what's your favorite way to use that? Um, there's, a, there's a dish, musakan, I think, in, in the Middle East, and uh, it's chicken uh, with tahini and some other things on a flatbread, and they, they put like two tablespoons of sumac on it. It it's, it's, sounds a bit odd, but it's absolutely fabulous. It's really a great, um, as I said, it's, it's a little sour and acidic and lemony, uh, and it really punches things up. It's just a, it's one of those great all-purpose spices everybody should have. You know, I, I hadn't heard of it three years ago. 
but now it's one of the things I use. You know, in, in India, they have the, the, uh, the tins, and they have eight little uh, containers in them. Yeah, the masala daba. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they, they have, usually they're all spice blends, or, or you could have individual spices, and I have one of those. Uh, and so if you scrambled up some eggs or you, you had something simple, you know, boiled vegetables, whatever, you know, and you have some of those things, you could have togarashi from Japan or whatever, just get some spice blends. And that's the easiest way in the world to take something bland and make it interesting. And sumac's one of those things you could use. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> With the medical uh, field pushing for less meat in people's food and dairy products, are you uh, working towards having more vegetarian kind of meals? Um, that's an interesting question, you know. It, it's turned out in Milk Street because we rate uh, the recipes after we publish them. Uh, and vegetables always win. And I can tell you 20 years ago that was not the case. Pork, chocolate, and beef always won 20 years ago. So I, I am surprised, actually, that the uh, home cooks have come a long way in the last 20 years. So I'm not motivated by health in particular. I mean, uh, I think Julia Child paraphrased Aristotle when she said, all things in moderation, including moderation. Um, at least I think it was Aristotle. It doesn't sound like something Aristotle would say. No, Aristotelian was it, ethics like, was are it? moderate, yeah. Okay. It's, it's, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so I, I sourced it properly, thank you. Uh, but I, I do think that if you think of meat as a flavoring, of course, unless you're having ribs, yeah, that's rib, ribs actually which are Rule fabulous. number 70 yeah. in new rules. Um, and being more vegetable forward. I mean, the problem is I grew up on the world's worst vegetables. I mean, they, we, we grew them, but my mother used to microwave them and not even salt them. Uh, or we cook squash for a couple hours, and, you know, whatever. So it was pretty grim. Um, I, think, I don't think there's a culture that cooks vegetables worse than the English and, and the traditional American uh, repertoire. Yeah, what is a mushy pea? Why? I, I don't know. <laughs> Why mushy peas? But, but I, I, I will say, though, this al dente thing has gotten totally out of hand. I was at a, I mean, I'm sorry, there was a, uh, a, a well-known Italian uh, cooking teacher uh, I, in Florence, and back in the 80s, I visited a friend of mine in the summer, and I took a class from Bugiali, uh, and there was a woman, uh, I believe she was Japanese, and sitting and talking about you know, al dente at this and al dente. Finally, he just blew up and said, Madam, in Italy, we cook our vegetables, you know. <laughs> so uh, I do like my vegetables cooked, but you're right. I think it's a more sensible way of, of thinking about food and meat's a part of it, but it's not the center of the plate anymore. It, it, occasionally, but not usually. Yeah, delicious. Everybody should have a meatless Monday every week, right? All right, we've got time for one more question and we've got to wrap this uh conversation up, and I think you guys get to do a meet and greet, so take yours right here. You talked about uh, just the right amount of water, ice water, in your pie crust, and then you said you'd get back to that. Oh, Would you yeah. oh yeah, thank you for putting a pin in Another that Another promise unfulfilled. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, well, here, here's the deal. What, um, what causes gluten to form really is water because there's glutenin and gliadin in the flour, and the water allows them to get in touch with each other and cause a matrix that causes gluten. So technically, by adding more water to flour and butter in a pie dough, you are potentially creating more gluten, which means a slightly tougher pie crust. The reason that's incredibly annoying is that if you watch people make pie crust at home, and most people don't do it very often, uh, they end up creating dry pie dough they can't roll out. So you're sitting there Thanksgiving morning trying to roll out the dough, and it's just it's not you know it's not coming together. So my feeling is risk a pie dough, and I can solve this problem another way. That's a little tougher, but at least you can roll it out and get it. If you can't roll it out and get the pan, what's the point? The other thing is uh, pea-sized pieces of butter. They say that. Please forget that. Um, what, what you should do is fully the cut the butter into the flour till it gets a little pebbly and sandy. Like Parmesan, and, looks like yeah, ground Parmesan. And yeah. it turns a little yellow. Then you're coating the flour with fat, and the flour is not gonna develop gluten as readily. So you'll have a very tender pie crust. So fully cut in the butter, which everyone says you shouldn't do, and add enough water so you can really uh, hold it together. The last thing is do it the night before. Because if you let it sit overnight in the fridge, it'll hydrate and it'll relax, it's much easier to roll out. So th that's, it's. It, Fully coating that flour is really important. Now, 
experts will say, well, American pie dough is supposed to be super flaky. Yeah, okay, fine. But, you know, again, we're not, we're not all experts here. So you, you just want to get a, a reasonably tender pie dough. You can get into the pie shell and cook for Thanksgiving. And that's all you worry about. As, as I said, it's not about being perfect. It's about what's practical. Yeah. Yeah, so be Finding practical. Finding that balance, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's going to be a shorter dough. That is, it's a little more crumbly, but it's still going to be wonderful. Uh, and it'll be tender because you cut the, the butter in properly. All right. Fantastic conversation. I think we solved yeah. everybody's problems. Uh, <laughs> or some you guys, of them. Have you guys been taking notes? Yeah. yeah two of them, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's been a great time talking to you. Thanks I think for having me. We're going to do some meet and greet kind of stuff for these guys now. All right. That's it. <laughs> Thank you again.